Um, good evening. I'm Jody Stevens. Uh, I'm working with Workers World Party Labor Forum. Uh, we're having a forum tonight, um, which is Let's Father the Fight for $15 in the Union. Uh, an incredible struggle uh, that we need to help forward, a struggle that has been continuing and that we want to embrace. Um, Sarah Caronado from Labor Against Racist Terror will be helping me facilitate the night meeting. Uh, we have speakers that will be from the People MTA. Uh, we also have a speaker from the People Power Assembly that will join us. But most of all, we'd like to uh, welcome Bob Lamont and Levon from Boston. Bob Lamont uh, is the person who has um, directed this very important film. Um, and he's here to actually you know, do a Q&A, but we'll watch the video and he will do a Q&A. Um, but first, um, we like to do some housekeeping, just starting with a chant. And Sarah Cat from Labor Against Racist Terror will lead us in this chant. When we fight, we win. 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 Uh, also, we like to um, raise that uh, soundtrack that you have been listening to was a soundtrack that parents of school transportation that was made for the um, school bus strike in 2000, March 2013, exactly five, years. exactly five years ago, which was a victory, uh, which was attacked by, and a lot, and still some losses. We're trying to get the employment protection provision uh, to be a part of it, but it's an ongoing struggle. And those sounds was the sound that actually really laid out what happened. And those are tools that we should be continuing to use in all our working campaign. Um, we we'll also like to uh, welcome Sue Davis from the Writers Guild and from the very important uh, Workers World Party on the picket line that will be a part of our program. Uh, for the housekeeping, um, we'd like to thank Dalia Grignan who is doing child care. Uh, also, Dalia, uh, very important work. And um, if any donation could happen, Dalia is a part of that. Um, so that we get the food. We also like to thank Sharon Yellis, who can't be here, but also prepared a meal for us. And people who actually did the flyer, did it in Spanish, translated, got it out, and got it up on their Facebook. Uh, it's all workers, and it's their labor power that we're dealing with. Um, uh, yes. Um, if no one don't want to have their picture taken, uh, please sit to this side. Uh, we um, did a few of that earlier, so we sort of got it at this particular point. Okay, now we'd like to introduce uh, Bob Lamont to actually uh, do an intro, and we'll watch the film, and then we will come back uh, to speak with the presentation and the workshop. Okay. Hello everyone, and thank you for inviting me and showing the film Street Scenes 15. And uh, I want to acknowledge Yvonne, one of the, also one of the video artists and worked on the movie. Uh, she did some great video for the movie. And um, I wanted to just start off by giving a quick, very quick introduction to the movie. That a government, we have a government that just gave away billions of dollars, billions of dollars to the corporate thieves. And here we are, not able to pay our workers, the workers, $15 an hour. And this movie is about the str uh, struggle in Boston and around the country, but it's shot in Boston in the years 2014, 2015, 2016. And uh, I hope you'll enjoy it, and I, hope, and I hope we have some great discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. 
Tommy Cephas. Um, I worked at McDonald's. I've been there for about a year. Um, it's tough out here for a worker nowadays. Making $8 an hour is not good enough for nobody. It's not good enough for nobody to live. It's not good enough for nobody to survive. It's not good enough for nobody to struggle. It's not good enough for nobody to take their lives on. It's not good enough for a family to be raised on. Why I'm here today is because as a home care worker, we provide care for elderly and disabled people. We provide care for the most vulnerable people in the world. But with the care we provide, nobody acknowledges how much work we do and how much we should be getting paid. Our wages do not represent the job that we do. And somebody needs to be held accountable and stop paying us what we deserve.
I've done a lot of jeffs throughout the Commonwealth and throughout this nation. And it's a shame before God. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And it's a sin and a shame before God when we trample upon people and allow them to walk in a way that is not dignified nor humane. I am a uh, manager of Burger King in Nashua, New Hampshire. Um, I had the privilege of working with Jeffrey for uh, the amount of time he was there. Uh, he, was, he was an all around good guy. Um, I had a privilege to work with him, talking to him. Um, he didn't really seem like trouble because, I mean, he was going through the struggle just like the rest of us. Um, each one of us are going through our own struggle, and it, it's hard because, you know, a lot of us are working our butts off to try to support our families. We can't because we got corporate greed that are, you know, stopping us. <laughs> um, it, it hurt everybody when I found out that Jeffrey, you know, was found dead in his cell. And I gotta tell you, everybody at work was was <laughs> really heartbroken over it. Um, like I said, he was a good guy. He didn't deserve what he got. And uh, we're all here, we're all in his name, and I know he's looking down on us, and he's proud of us because he would want this. He would want to be here fighting for our right, for our living wage, and for able to support our families. Pero esos jefes abusivos no nos van a callar. Y con el apoyo de todos ustedes vamos a seguir exigiendo respeto y el salario digno de 15 que todos nosotros merecemos. Hello, my name is Mariana. I am Fabiana's daughter, so I'll be translating for her. Hello, my mother's name is Fabiana Santos, and she worked for almost 14 years in the kitchen of Faneuil Hall Restaurant McCormick and Schmitz. When co-workers and her stood up to complain about sexual harassment, verbal abuse, and other problems, and other problems on the job, the company tried to intimidate and to silence them. And in the end, two of them, including my mother, were fired. Every day, other immigrant workers like my mother are suffering discrimination, sexual harassment, wage theft, and other abuses. And if they speak up, they are threatened with being fired or turned over to immigration. Yeah, I want to talk about the two bills that are in front of the Senate right now. Um, one of the bills is for fast food workers and for big box store workers. These corporations have billions of dollars. We eat at some of these establishments. We spend our money in these establishments. They deserve to pay the workers a living wage. They have the money and the means to do it. So they need to just get it done. Bottom line. We ain't playing. We ain't playing. We out here every day working hard. Equal work for equal pay and the corporations are benefiting off our blood, sweat, and tears and time away from our family and friends and education trying to strive to make a better choice for our lives in Massachusetts and they deserve to give it up to us. I'm a student and I can barely afford to pay my tuition. This is unacceptable. How many, how many students are here today? We in the United States of America lives. And I will tell you that this out here is what democracy looks like. It is on the streets. It is in the churches. It is in the union halls where great things in this country have originated. And you need to continue to show your leadership and raise your voices so that our colleagues in there can hear that they will be, not be denied. And make sure when you vote and when you support people who are running for office that they have pledged to $15 an hour. Now this campaign is about differences that I have with Secretary Clinton. Let me lay out just a few of them. Today, the minimum wage of seven and a quarter an hour is a starvation wage. 
She wants to raise the minimum wage to 12 bucks an hour. Not good enough! Together we're going to raise our minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. Five years ago, no time at all, as we were here, somebody jumps up and says, you know, Bernie, this $7.25 federal minimum wage, starvation wage, we got to raise that minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. The person next to him would say, $15 an hour? You want to more than double the minimum wage? You're crazy. You're thinking too big. It's impossible. Maybe eight bucks, maybe 10 bucks, 15 bucks, no way. But what happened is that workers in the fast food industry, the McDonald's and Burger King, Wendy's, they went out on strike. They stood up, they fought back, and they told this country, we can't make it on a starvation wage. And then what happened two years ago, Seattle, Washington, 15 bucks, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oregon, California, New York State, 15 bucks an hour. person who's going to come up now, but we need to do this person without the uh, camera. It's okay? All right. Um, 
So while you're getting that shut down, I'll just mention that um, Workers World has some very good uh, studies done about this character of this working class as we describe. People who realize that they are part of the international working class, they've got the same boss, so we might as well have the same struggle. Um, and we're, um, are we good? Okay, so people, well, we'll talk about it more. All right, so we're gonna bring up Raphael, who has a lot of experience organizing workers, and to talk about union, why it's important to have a union matter what the boss says. How we doing everyone? Familia, how estamos? Woo! Woo! All right. Woo! Great film. Um, very well done. Five for 15, the working class rising up. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is actually something that is really not being talked about much, which is uh, union busting. Um, let me ask everyone here a question. Have you ever heard in the workplace the term, uh, we are family? <laughs> we're family, all right? Uh, yeah, we're family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. We have an open door policy. Okay, great. Let's see a few hands up. Uh, we're family, we have an open door policy. Uh, let's be team players. All these terms are actually anti-union busting messaging. Anti-union is a big business in this country. Uh, I'm just gonna give you an example of just three companies, how much they spent uh, last year alone to teach upper management and how to keep the union out. Even if they have a union, how to take the union out. Perfect example, Kraft, Heinz. Spent $153,000, which is nothing for them. Uh, we have uh, one that you all know, which is Domino Pizza. Domino Pizza paid uh, $167,000 no, $167, last year alone to train upper management in how to have this anti-union messaging going and how to divide the workers, how to take the power away from workers. Basically, it is about dividing workers racially, dividing workers with overtime, dividing workers with per diem workers, dividing workers with female, males, Latino against blacks, and basically all, all this is done very scripted across the country. I have organized across the country from here to California, and it's the same scripted message. Divide workers, don't let workers come together at all. One more anti-union message. Have you ever heard where you work, do not show each other's paycheck. Do not discuss how much each individual makes. Yeah. Their biggest fear is when workers come together and actually start relating to each other about how much they're struggling. How much that they cannot afford health insurance. That they cannot pay the rent. When workers start having this conversation and they start relating to each other in the struggle, then you have a chance to actually decide, we deserve better. Let's come together, let's form a union. But these anti-union busters, which they are known as HR consultants, uh, teach upper management in how to keep this going in the union shop or even in the non-union shop. I call it psych psychological welfare. Because it is psychological warfare. You're actually working on people's emotions, working on people's fear. And this is a huge business, which basically people in this country, even organizers, even labor leaders, like everyone in this room, this is not a conversation we're having. We're not having a conversation about how these anti-union consulting firms are actually infiltrating the whole workforce in this country and are actually doing a good job. They're doing an amazing job. People are afraid to come together and organize. And these are things that anti-union consultants' bigger fear is actually when we expose them. When we start exposing them, 
about the work they doing in these shops and in these hospitals in, in, in any in any industry when you expose them workers get angry workers get angry that they're being used workers get angry like wow being manipulated we're all being used we're all being divided and then what happens is workers turn that anger and actually organize and actually do a pretty good job in organizing so as labor leaders I want to put this out that we need to start exposing them which that should be a conversation everywhere you ask everyone about anti-union messaging and people have no idea what that's all about People have no idea how these corporations are making money, spending millions of dollars to actually work on the workers' emotions and try to create this fear. Um, we're going to be having future classes on this. Um, Johnny, Will, and myself were speaking about it. We're going to be having future classes here uh, to start teaching uh, workers about what's happening in their shop in more details. Thank you, Raphael, again. Uh, the importance of um, what is a union uh, beyond um, your organization and choose to fight with. And I'm looking forward to having class around that. Uh, I'd like to introduce the next speaker, uh, who will be Sue Davis. And Sue Davis is from the UAW uh, 1981. She's also uh, editor of On the Picket Line. Uh, introducing her, I ask everyone to look at the flag that's in front of me, Florida Prisoner Strike, uh, that we will talk to later in relationship to the NCA. Also, I would like people to really read the front page of Workers World, two parties, <coughs> and page eight, the Florida Prisoner Strike, uh, which actually deals with the 13th Amendment, uh, the Haitian immigrant, um, that strike that we supported was a statewide prison strike in Florida that Geo Hill wrote on. And it actually tells you how to su continue to support these very important workers' struggle. And I'd like to introduce Sue Davis. Thank you. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I joined the National Writers Union in 1987. Um, and because I had written a novel, a draft of a novel, but I hadn't published it yet. Um, but my real labor understanding uh, came from when I was invited in 2003 by Leslie Feinberg to write the column on the picket line for Workers' World newspaper. Now, I did a little research on this. It turns out that 2018 will be the 35th anniversary of that column in Workers' World. It was founded, uh, the initial writer was Shelley Ettinger, who wrote it for about 20 years. Um, she began in 83. And uh, I, Shelley went back to work full time and she could no longer continue to do it. So Leslie invited me to do it. And I'd never done any writing about labor before. It was a new experience for me. But I have learned so much over the last 15 years of doing the column. It's just wonderful. And I'm so glad we started with this film because I really think that the current movement around um, the fight for uh, 15 and a union has really, really energized the labor movement and has really kicked off a whole new um, emphasis on organizing within the labor movement. And it really, really shows 
uh, how important the fight back struggle is. What we try to do in on the picket line is we don't cover issues that are going on in depth, but we try to get a cross section of struggles that are going on all around the country. And we try to highlight all the actions that workers are taking all over the country to fight racism, to fight sexism, to fight for equal pay, to, to expose the bosses at every turn. And one of the most important struggles in that regard is going on right here in New York with the Spectrum workers. Because they have been on strike since March, which is 10 months. And they have stood really strong. And now that their unemployment benefits have run out, they're really, they're really hitting, hitting a really incredible arc mm. in, in the struggle. It took the Central Labor Council a long, long, long time before they even started supporting the Spectrum workers which is really unfortunate. And they should be out mobilizing workers all over the city in the streets. And it's really a tribute to our party that we had a small but important action last week during the days of rage. Um, highlighting the issues in the spectrum strike. So um, I'm here. Um, and if you've got questions about it, I think there are about 10, 12 maybe unions in the country who are really on the cutting edge of what's going on. Um, and I'm proud to say the UAW is one of them. We, um, we carried a banner, Region 9A carried the banner in, in last year's uh, Labor Day parade that was taken from the action on August 14th in Durham, uh, which was no Trump, no KKK, no fascist USA. Mm. And it was wonderful to be able to march behind that banner. Um, I think there's a lot of organizing going on on campuses. And I'm hoping John will talk about what's going on at Columbia now, because I know there's struggles going on there. But um, organizing adjuncts uh, is really important, and it's all over the country. Um, and it, I, I can proudly report that 18 states raised their minimum wage all across the country as of January 1. Now, I don't know what the average was, but I assume it was around 10 bucks an hour, if not maybe even up to 12. But there aren't a lot that are at 15 at this point. So the struggle really, really needs strong support. And I hope Bob's wonderful uh, video of the struggle in Massachusetts um, will get wide circulation. Uh, certainly among all of Workers World's uh, branches, if not on a wider scope through many, many unions. Anyway, if people have questions about the column, and also, even better, if you're involved in struggles that are really important, please let me know. Um, you can reach me through the paper, um, and I enjoy looking forward to working with you. Thanks. Our next speaker will be John uh, Steffens. John is with People MTA, uh, which is dealing with community labor uh, and that raised very important struggle um, like disability uh, rights, uh, jobs, uh, good services. And um, let's welcome John. People MTA. Hey, the A to the C, the subway to be free. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Uh, 
for inviting the People's MTA to speak at this event about uh, what we're up to. Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah. Um, so I'm with the People's MTA, which formed last summer, uh, which the media called uh, the Summer of Hell in New York because the trains were so bad. It was definitely a hot button issue. It was being talked about daily. And uh, some of us really wanted to intervene in this struggle uh, and make sure that um, a certain analysis was known about who was actually to blame, uh, who was behind the summer of hell. And uh, for us, it was the banks. Mm. Um, the media, and I'll talk about this a little later, um, tries to blame the workers, and they even blamed the commuters. Uh, worse, many of the commuters themselves blame the workers. I, I know personally one time I was riding a cab back from the airport and um, we were talking about how bad the trains are. It's just, it's a hot topic, you know, people are talking about because it it's impacting their daily lives. They're late to work and this, this, this could lead to them losing their jobs, you know. Um, and he actually said that the whole, uh, the, all the MTA workers are incompetent and they should all be fired. A, a regular person, not like a, you know, this is just a person, a commuter, said all of the workers should be fired. That's how vile the sentiment can be in this city against the workers. And so the People's MTA, one of the major points of our program is that we need to build solidarity with workers in transportation. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm just, yeah. I'll, I'll read our program because there's, there's a, a lot of issues that we're trying to raise, but I will try and focus on why the banks are to blame and not the workers in this, this brief talk. But the People's MTA, calls for 100% accessibility for wheelchair users and riders yeah. with specific transportation needs. Uh, we demand lower subway fares, more mm. trains, an end to racist police harassment in the mm. subway, shorter wait times, fewer delays, and justice and union rights for transport workers, Local 100. Mm. Oh, right on! Um, okay. So, I'll just start briefly about how we formed, because uh, labor has been central to the struggle from the start. Many of us were involved in the uh, New York City Workers' Defense Committee. Um, we had heard that an MTA uh, station worker um, up near Columbus Circle had been uh, harassed by the police uh, and arrested on trumped up charges for supposedly not assisting the police mm -hmm. and helping them to catch a alleged shoplifter. Uh, he was charged with obstruction of, judge, uh, of justice, assaulting a police officer, uh, he was um, relieved of uh, his service without any pay, um, and we went to the board meetings to demand that the union and the uh, MTA uh, support him. Um, and it was clear that the cop was lying. Mm. Um, all of the, after a brief investigation, all of the stores in the area said that they didn't report any shoplifters. Wow. Um, but also, if there even was a shoplifter, cops have uh, subway passes. Right. They have passes and they have keys to open the doors. So they didn't need help from the station agent. And uh, as Daryl Goodwin, the worker, had said, um, he was busy helping someone at the booth, and it's part of the policy of station agents to help someone at the booth before they assist anyone at the gate. Right. So he was just doing his job and he got fired for it. Wow. And then he had to face all of these charges. So we were doing court support with him and um, you know, uh, the case barely got off the ground when he died. Right. He had a heart attack and we knew it was the stress of the case. You know, we knew, he knew the odds were stacked against him. We live in a uh, anti-worker country uh, and he was black. We live in a deeply white supremacist racist country mm. and uh, the courts would not be on his side but we tried to stand up for him and upon going to the um, board meetings we uh, discovered that there were other struggles ongoing around transportation uh, and it was primarily the disability rights activists who we met at these board meetings. The first one we went to go to talk about uh, Daryl Goodwin, we met uh, maybe 60 uh, disability rights activists mm. there. And you, you, you really have to understand how difficult it is to get around here when you have a disability and how incredible it is that they were able to mobilize 60 people. It could take maybe one person a half hour to get to the MTA board meeting from where they live, but for someone with a disability, it could take two hours. 
and the meetings start at 9. So that means that they're calling up Accessoride, which is the disability service, to come and pick them up at 7 to drop them off, or they're trying to navigate the trains uh, to get there. And, and we, we, wanted, we realized that there was a wider struggle here, and that uh, while we wanted to fight for workers' rights, we wanted to widen the str struggle. And so we shifted our energy after uh, the tragic death of Daryl Goodwin to this wider struggle with the People's MTA, which became our vehicle. And we noticed that um, the people who should be making the decisions around transport uh, were on the other side of the boardroom. They were behind a partition uh, where all of the decisions were made. And the people sitting around uh, the, you know, the uh, table where yeah, the, the decisions were being made were mostly financiers and, and real estate, yes, and all of them were white, sure. uh, real estate developers. Um, no one who really rode the trains. And the TWU does have a representative on there, but they're not a voting member. So it's like just window dressing to make it look like there's popular participation when there's not. Um, so that's how things got started. And this is the analysis that we put forward about why there was a summer of hell. Uh, now, just to give you some perspective, um, last summer there was a, there was a derailment uh, in Harlem, a uh, predominantly black community, uh, that injured 30 people. And there were three Amtrak derailments last year. 74% uh, of subway riders have been late to work because delays are up 237% since 2012. 70,000 delays every month. Uh, and what was the MTA's solution to this? They called for more cops to criminalize littering because they thought that commuters littering were causing track fires that were leading to 70,000 delays every month. Then they demanded that they should take out seats from the subway cars so more people can fit in. But as you know, and we've been uh, showing on these really wonderful uh, flyers that uh, a comrade made, that um, taking out the seats is saying that uh, don't carry anything heavy in the subway, don't get disabled, uh, don't have any reason to sit, uh, don't get pregnant, you know, those are all reasons why people need to sit, and don't this was their solution. Old. Or don't get old, yeah, this, this was the MTA solution. And then they also said, uh, just get to the train earlier, oh. you know, incorporate the delays into your daily schedule. Like, how fucked up is that? So, really? meanwhile, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's a fight going on between de Blasio and Cuomo and Joe Loda, who's the head of the MTA, about how there's a lack of funding. Where's the money going to come from? Well, the problem with this, this fight about money, is that it hides a glaring issue, and that is that the MTA does have the money. Right. And that the role, uh, th that the banks play a huge role in shaping the MTA budget. But this is never talked about, because none of these politicians want to go up against the banks. As it stands, 16% of the MTA's budget goes toward what is called debt service. The MTA primarily funds its projects by taking on loans from major banks. The amount of money that it owes is equivalent to that of the debt of the city of Chicago and LA. It's actually the fifth largest debtor in the country. The MTA, however, promises uh, that it will pay back these loans with interest. And debt service refers to the amount of interest it pays. In 2017, the MTA paid $2.6 billion in interest alone, which is $2.6 billion that could go to all sorts of improvements. Right. Yeah. Now, the issue is that the only way the MTA is able to get these loans is by promising that it will pay back the interest. And the state guarantees that. So if for whatever reason the MTA doesn't make back enough money from uh, subway fares and other sources of revenue and it can't pay the interest, the state will step in and guarantee to pay it. So this is a part of a wider discussion, but capitalism is at a dead end. These corporations are having a hard time finding profitable investment, right? So if they're trying, if the one place that they can make a profit that's guaranteed is to put it into something like the MTA, into the transportation system, because then the state will step in to pay back their interests. Right. So they're going to make their profit. So that's why the struggle around transportation is so key, because it puts 
front and center the role of finance capital and the immiseration of the working class. And that's the analysis that we're putting out there. Now, we have heard, and the media always talks about this, about signal malfunctions, that, but the, you know, that the, they don't have uh, proper equipment. Um, the system hasn't been updated since the 30s. And that it works at all is due to the hard work of the TWU. Right. They're working in really difficult conditions. And they're making it work the best that they can. It's not their work, and yet uh, it's not their fault. And yet the media tries to blame them. And not only does it try to blame them for the, the, um, the, uh, the malfunctions, the signal delays, but then it also goes on to say that one of the reasons that uh, the MTA doesn't have enough money to make the changes is because of these goddamn greedy workers, right? We hear this all the time. The workers want too much money. And then you get a really, really, really uh, sleazy sleight of hand in some of these articles uh, that come out. I believe uh, this one is from the New York Times where uh, they say that the average compensation for the workers is uh, 140, no, I'm sorry, station agents make an average of $112,000 annually, but they include the overtime and benefits. That's not, yeah, they include their benefits. That's not just the salary. The salary is actually much lower. That's really fucked up. It's a really sneaky way of fucking cooking the books to make it look like the workers are getting more than they're actually getting, right? So this, this is the state of things. What's up? It's been really anti-worker. Horribly anti-worker, and this shit is everywhere in the liberal media, in the conservative media, and it's really important that we get out the workers' position, a working class position, and that is what we're trying to push here. Um, so, do, 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 do. Um, I think I will I will close it out there. But uh, Facebook page, the Facebook page, yeah, go. Uh, it's um, you can find us at. Uh, People's MTA, it's PPLSMTA on Facebook. Uh, so please check out our page. We'll be having actions coming up. Uh, we really want to do uh, more solidarity work with TWU. Uh, we've already put in a lot of work around the Daryl Goodwin case, and we hope to continue fighting for uh, these workers' rights who are under attack from so many different angles. Uh, and, 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 and the reason that they're under attack is because they have a lot of fucking power. Mm -hmm. When they went on strike in 2005, Right at the height of the shopping season at Christmas, they shut the fucking city down. Mm -hmm. Everyone's profits were going down, and the city jumped in to make a compromise within only a couple of days. So they have a lot of power, and if the community is on their side, you know, maybe they'll be willing to go out and strike. But if we're fucking attacking them, if, like we heard workers at the MTA board meeting saying, telling the MTA, you need to make these changes because my life is in danger. When there are delays, there are work, there are commuters who will come up and attack the workers. So you know, they're coming. They're under attack at a lot of different angles, and we need to we need to bridge that divide. It's really and build important. the strap hangers. Yeah, we need. Yeah, exactly, exactly. All the strap hangers, uh, the the commuters need to come together with the workers. So uh, thank you again for for having us. Hey. Uh, now we'd like to get into uh, our discussion uh, and workshop, uh, which we hope to come out of it with the to follow all these very important talks and follow um, the film as a tool um, to begin that discussion. Uh, first of all, I'd like to recognize uh, Ando from the South Bronx Congress. Uh, we have to recognize him, who did a lot of this work around MTA, around getting elevated lift, around the very important work uh, in uh, Hostel College, Lincoln Hospital. Uh, this, is, this is Angela. We like to recognize him. Um, okay, um, a little bit more housekeeping before we go to there. Uh, we like to thank Judy and Fred for video and filming, because we're looking for tools to father this work. So thank y'all. Yay! It's your work is power. They were donated. And um, i like to say that the Street Scene 15 uh, on January 22nd was carried on Diane, our comrade in Atlanta, Workers' War Party member. Uh, she has a radio show which was uh, WRFG 98.98 uh, 98 FM. 
that Bob yeah, was a yeah. part of the interview there, and people should listen to that station. And we were really looking for other ways to really get Street Scene 15 out. And that was um, one of, um, we we're following on that particular struggle. So now I would like to um, actually the one to join us, but I'd like Bob <coughs> and Vermont to actually start the discussion um, on uh, how we go forward uh, with all these important struggles at 15,000 hour street scene. Oh yeah, I'd like to tell you about, you should explain this um, very important video that Bob had did, which is teachers are talking, is the nation listening? Uh, and it tells you a lot about workers, teachers, and that very important struggle that's ongoing and so forth. So people should really uh, get this to pass it around to the organization and have community meetings as well as a tool. One of the uh motivations behind making Street Scenes 15 was to um, get the message out to people everywhere and to um, really to use film, filmmaking as an organizing tool. It's an opportunity to get the discussion going, but it's also an opportunity to, for people, uh, what they have to say to be uh, acknowledged and communicated, which often doesn't happen. Often you see a two-second or a three-second clip of somebody's feet marching down the street or, you know, quick, not very little content, um, just a quick thing, and you don't really have uh, hear what they have to say. So I really, I wanted people to hear what was happening at the rallies, that they had powerful, strong, uh, dynamic things to say, and I also wanted people to, to, to be able to, um, get a feel for what it's like to be out there and to feel the excitement, the passion, the enjoyment. And uh, if you look at people in the film, they were determined, but they were also joyful. They were out there feeling strong, fighting, fighting hard, and uh, in enjoying the fight. And that, I think that's part of what we all have to do in the, over this long haul of fighting um, all these terrible things that are happening to people. We also have to uh, enjoy what we're doing and try to make it enjoyable. And if you notice, one of the organizing techniques that they did that was great is during the speeches, I don't know if you could come through as much on the movie, but when you're there, they keep the beat going, they keep the music going in the background, they keep the, the, the pace, your heart pace is up, everything the pace is up as the speeches are going, the band's playing in the background. So it's a great organizing tool to keep the whole place energized. And I'm. What, that's one of the things I wanted to try and get that feeling portrayed and put out there on film and to have meetings where people could organize and um, spread the word. That was one of my main motivations. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does anybody want to do a question, Johnny? Or does anybody have any questions or any, anything? What are you working on now? I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> I was not a plant. <laughs> okay. If you weren't, um, Yvonne was going to ask that question. No, just kidding. Now, I already had a plant plan. No, uh, actually, the movie I'm working on now is called New Dreams for a New World. And uh, you can imagine maybe a little bit of what it's about from the title. But my, what I'm thinking about now is to look at how many years we've been going on uh, in this country. We have a, a economic system, we have a government that can't feed its people, that um, can't house its people, it, it can't do a, a boatload of things for everybody. We're all hurting. Everybody's hurting except those billionaires that just got that tax break. So uh, I am hoping to bring a message to um, people out there of what people's new dreams are. What are your dreams for uh, the world? What do, what do we need to see? And is it, is it going to be solved by this current government? Is it going to be solved, all these dreams, uh, all these issues that need to be solved, homelessness, uh, um, hunger, school education that's not destroying the spirit of our children? And uh, we want to, I want to show what people's dreams are and maybe imagine what it would be like to have a, a government 
an economic system that could do that, that could take care of its people. And what is that going to look like? So I want to, I want to try and present a positive message uh, to the world. I mean, there's enough crimes that, uh, that are committed by this government and people in charge now. Uh, it's heard of all the time. We can indict people time and time again, but what are we going to present as a movement, as on the left, as a progressive movement, what are we presenting to sh as a vision for what kind of life we would like to see? And that's just a small topic for the for this movement. Yeah. <laughs> just a small What's topic. happening with just the 15 an hour movement in the last year? Um, well, in, in Boston what's happening is they were going the legislative route to try and get um, a, a state law passed and that was running up against resistance. So right, what what they're doing right now is they've got a ballot question. They've got the signatures. They put it on the ballot, uh, and it's successfully it's coming up this November, and, the, and it's going to be make it law for $15 an hour minimum wage. And the it's a great coalition going on um, called Raise Up, Raise Up Massachusetts, and it's got a lot of different organizations. Um, Fight 15, 11.99, and a whole bunch of other organizations that go. And you saw in the movie all the different signs and different people from all the different all the organizations in Boston. So they got the petition signed, and it's going to be on the ballot. And the way they're doing it is, it's going to be raised up a dollar each year if this ballot pa question passes. And they've been pretty successful in the past at getting ballot questions passed. So they're going that route. And um, but I'd like to see the $15 an hour minimum wage put more in the national um, discussion. It's been in the national discussion and it's knocked out of the national discussions in many ways by the ridiculous coverage that they're doing now on every ridiculous thing that's going on. That's the diversion about what's important like the $15 an hour. That's got to, we've got to work to get out there to organize, demonstrate, and um, show um, Organizing movies on everywhere mm. and use it like, like we're doing today. Yeah. I think or, uh, showing an organizing film is a very underutilized mm. method of organizing, right. mm -hmm. and it, it gives a chance for people to feel <coughs> strong. They see themselves out on the street, they see others out on the street, and then they have a chance to go to a meeting and have a great discussion. Good job. Yeah, um, I was wondering. Uh, I'm a younger comrade. I wasn't involved in struggle when at, at the height of this movement. But I was wondering how like the media was talking about it. You know, when it was part of that national discourse, were they slandering the workers? Were yeah? What was the debate there? Well, you had the usual cast of characters saying, "Oh, this is going to uh, destroy our economy. This is going to keep." put us back, or we can't afford it, it's a, or small businesses can't afford it. Now, that's part of it, that's one of their tactics, one of their techniques. And uh, of course we were saying that's ridiculous, we need the $15 uh, an hour minimum wage to survive and to have a half decent um, ability to pay your bills and to put food on the table. So it, they're always, um, the talking heads are always coming up with that, well that's one of the main ways they did it. So um, obviously we've got to be out there and um, taking 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 on that message. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so are we, Johnny, asking questions of the other speakers now also? Because, oh yes. Oh, please. Okay, other speakers, please address this if you can. Um, so the MTA, which I worked for for many years, is a horrible, cutthroat capitalist institution. However, what I'd like to hear the message a little bit clear, so I really want to ask you directly tell us. When you're on the subway or the bus, what do we say to the other commuters, for example? Do we say, besides, I always tell them go to that Facebook page, but do we say there's money for these repairs, there's no reason these delays have to be all day long, they could be just at night, we could hire more workers, stop the interest on the loans, because that's where the main struggle has to be, so you get really clear message out to not only the uh, media, but the everyday social media people who can uh, kind of outsmart now just the capitalist media. And for uh, Sue, Sue, how can other unions work together with this very rank and file issue? Because we can't even get to these meetings on Saturdays and Sundays for Workers' World or anything else 
because the horror of dealing with these trains and these buses are keeping people like isolated. So another thing I was thinking for you just to give you support is we need to have roving caravans like we could have it at the back of a big you know, vehicle and we could have these things in the summertime, especially on, you know, just the video with the fighting and the chanting. They might not be able to hear, but they could just see the physical. Ride it out to Queens, ride it out to the Bronx, ride it out to, you know, Brooklyn. Uh, hey, uh, how the banks are behind the MTA cuts, the case for a people's MTA. And some of the things that we've talked about, you know, one, which is not, you know, totally wild as far as, um, liberal bourgeois capitalist democracies go is that uh, you can call a moratorium on the debt Great. like a legal halting of payments and it happened in the 30s and you can you know recall past actions of the US government you know it's not outside the realm of possibilities that they call a moratorium on the debt that they halt the payments and they allow uh, you know the, that uh, money that would go to debt service to start going towards the improvements the other thing is uh, Really, uh, I mean, demanding or showing that they have the money, but also uh, raising how the federal government uh, uses some of its money, like who it bails out. You know, uh, during the uh, 2008 financial crisis, uh, they put all of their money, or uh, they give all their money to the banks. You know, that trillion dollars that they, they bailed out the banks. You know, so they have this money. It's just uh, as far as their priorities go, it's about saving the banks and in this case it's just a, a, a repetition of that same logic so saying that they have the money and that they can put it instead of giving it to the banks by stepping in and guaranteeing that the banks will get the interest paid you can use that federal stimulus money to go towards you know uh, uh, improving uh, the infrastructure you know and, and really calling out what their priorities are, which is to bail out the banks, which is not helping anyone except for the banks. So for the commuters, a quick line you say is moratorium on the debt. Is that something we need to have memorized? We are currently trying to figure out what exactly, I mean, we have these, these demands here that I read off, but as far as what our slogans are going to be around the issues of the banks, I think uh, we're still trying to figure out what, like, what, yeah, what the best way is to, because it's really complicated, you know. I mean, we can call a moratorium, but we haven't, uh, as a group, really settled on that. We're, you know, we've been mostly focused on uh, disability rights issues and working with the disabilities community. But because um, I, I, I don't want to speak for the whole group, that that's what we say, you know. Uh, but that is something that we've considered in the past, and that uh, we we need to think more about. I know we want to open up the books. We want to make the budget accessible and transparent so that people can see where the priorities are. That's the first step. And then once it is transparent, we can point to it and say, hey, check this out. Look how fucked up this is. You know, they don't care about you. Uh, but yeah, as far as our demands, yeah, I'll, I'll like take a step back for a second. But that's that's our analysis. Open you know? the books might be easier. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um. I think in New York City, one of the major obstacles that we have to consider is that the leadership in the New York City Labor Council is totally conservative. They, as I mentioned before, they never jumped on the, the spectrum strike, strike when they should have. They finally got on it around Labor Day, which was like six months after it had started, um, it's an impediment to doing progressive organizing in New York City because it doesn't have an activist um, motivation. It's, it's reactionary and if Raphael wants to add some points on that, I think it'd be really important. Yeah, Because um, he's been sitting here Nodding his head. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, in New York City, which we should be like a powerhouse, it's at 22.8% organized. Across the country, New York City has the highest rate of organized workers. We should be a powerhouse in New York. But we're so divided, it's so part of this whole anti-union messaging that the unions is actually like a third party type of thing. Workers do not take ownership of the 23.8%. 8% at all. They, could, they don't even know they're in the union, half of them. They don't even understand how a union works. Like if workers understood what a union was, New York City, that would not be happening. So what should we do? Uh, we need to start 
getting back to basics. We need yeah. to start talking to workers, not the leadership. Right. Because right. basically we're talking to the leadership and we're feeding right into the third party mentality that those that is the union. The union is actually the worker. So it's a lot of work that we got to do as activists to go back to basic and start talking to the grassroots. That's the hard part. It's easy to say, I'm going to talk to the union leaders because we need this, we need unity and all that. That does not get anywhere. That does not get anywhere because we're, we we're feeding feelings. right into the third party that the union is the union leadership. Does that connect with the people's assemblies at all? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can have a discussion after. Because they could do worker education. Yeah. So, um... I just want to get a couple of dates on people's calendar, um, and I agree with everything that's been said. Um, and, and what what was just said reminded me of this cartoon where um, the union membership is like the gym membership. If you don't show up and do the exercise, you're not going to get any stronger. <laughs> so everybody, it. if you have a union, you know, take advantage of that and find out what it can do, not just for you, bread and butter, but if they can contribute anything into the, the struggles that we care about passionately. Um, so, for instance, um, I'm in the UFT, and everybody knows the same kind of thing. The leaders act more like politicians. They almost have the same bureaucracy that the Department of Education has. But there's a lot of people at the other levels, and there's a lot of good shop stewards, we call them chapter leaders, and, and they're actually this year, uh, you know, caucuses and, and bits and pieces here and there that got into the movement of um, hashtag Black Lives Matter in school. So actually the first week, the first full week of February that starts the 5th, there's places where they're going to be, you know, wearing t-shirts or putting up posters of the 13 principles of, of the movement for black lives Great. and things like that. So even though, you know, it's it's not shutting everything down and walking out of the school because the school is racist, it, you, you know, folks are finding ways to work towards more and more uh, militancy. The, dating the, the date of that in New York is February 5th to the 8th. So next Monday, not tomorrow, but next Monday, there's uh, some events in the community, even in Brooklyn Museum, they're talking about, you know, you have to hire more black teachers. It's actually going down. It went up after the struggles yeah. of the 60s mm. and 70s, and it went back down. Mm. And anyway, that's a whole other story. But February 1st, the whole month of February is the 50th anniversary of the Memphis sanitation strike. Mm. And the two workers who were killed, I'm nervous so I don't remember the name, Eddie probably remembers. It happened on February the 1st, 1968. So the, the local that still exists is the AFSCME local in Memphis. They called and they made an appeal to sanitation workers everywhere to take a moment of silence, park your truck, and just reflect. So that doesn't sound like a work stoppage, but it is. Right? Especially if they all do it at the same minute. <laughs> but, you know, um, and then other unions took that and it's now brought it out to, you know, anybody. Stop and think. Even if you're just a human being, you don't have to be a sanitation worker or a union member, you know, to acknowledge uh, who really makes everything clean and they make everything move and they make, you know, it's the workers and that, and that racism holds back all workers and all of the ills that, that, that those murders really signify. Um, the other thing, because of that, there's a day, what are they calling it? Uh, I'm not going to get the name right, but on the 24th, which is a Saturday, here in Miami and Philly and a bunch of other places, the Midwest, there's a day of action and it's because that Monday after that is when the Supreme Court hears the Janus oh. case that has to do with, you know, are your dues going to be paid for you or are you going to have to run around and go to the union office with cash or what? So, or worse, you know, it's union busting. Right. Um, for public sector workers. 
for, okay, for public sector workers, but if they could take out the public sector workers, they could take out everybody yep. because right. I think we're the majority. Say the date again, the 24th. 24th, Saturday. I don't know yet the time, but I think it's down in the Foley Square in the court area because it relates to the Supreme Court. So it, with these things coming up, it's an opportunity for everyone to speak with their coworkers and to make the connection that, like we just said, what happens in one sector affects the other sectors, and that we're all workers, and um, you know that that the the courts don't we can't leave everything up to oh they're smart they have a law degree they're gonna do the right thing you know it, there has to be a lot of heat under them and there has to be people in the streets um, so that's this month. Judy. Um, I, uh, at first I was wondering if you can send the links or something to me so I can get it up on the okay. party's Facebook page. Sure. Um, the second thing I was wondering about is, um, like I've never personally been unionized because I've always worked in the private sector and um, there's a big uh, chunk of the population that is unemployed or underemployed oh. and a lot of it is a lot of younger people too who may or may not be with college degrees. So in other countries, I've read about how unemployed people actually create, create their own trade unions or unions. And I was wondering if someone wanted to start a union from scratch, does anybody have the knowledge of how that would work? Uh, there are all kinds of workers groups that have come together within, I would say, at least the last 10 years. Um, that have like the laundry workers and uh, you know we could name a bunch of them but there are none in my head at the moment that I can name other than the laundry workers. Right. Um, what about the people's assembly? Whatever. Um, it's, it's really, um, there are ways to go about it. There's um, the organization Rock in the restaurant workers. Um, there are a number of workers organizations that have sprung up to help defend workers. There's one in North Carolina called Flock Farm Labor Organizing Committee that represents um, thousands of farm workers who are mostly immigrants. But it's possible to start a, a worker support group like that much more easily than than forming a union. Yeah. So if people are really serious about doing that kind of organizing, then I would say start with a workers committee and, and have it grow. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention was that I think that overall, if you look at the political movement in this country. I think a lot of the struggle around 15 and the Union started growing because of the Black Lives Matter yes. movement. That, that it, it changed the atmosphere. And the whole issue about civil rights, about human rights, has really jumped off Thanks to the Black Lives Matter movement, I, I you know, uh, 2014 Ferguson was really a turning point, and I think there's been a tremendous movement forward, which has, even if there, even if unions are kind of screaming and struggling to try to figure out who they are and what they're doing, it's affected unions, because. I know that my union in the UAW would never have ever have had a banner like that in our Labor Day parade if it weren't for a very strong movement in this country. And I think we need to consider it within that context mm -hmm. because the fight for social justice is has spread enormously since the turning point in Ferguson in 2014. And I think we need to recognize that as a really important force. Eddie? Um, 
Uh, I'm Eddie Ewitt um, in CWA Local 1180. I'm also on the Disability Pride Parade Committee. Um, my union won a civil rights complaint against New York City in 2015 for violating the Equal Pay Act Civil Rights Bill of 1963, which requires employers all across the country to pay women workers the same as men. Um, what I wanted to say about $15 an hour is this is the 80th anniversary of the Fair Labor and Standards Act of 1938, which excludes more than 20 different categories of workers from the minimum wage, including $15 an hour, including people with disabilities, including prisoners, including immigrants. Actually, there's a federal law that the maximum wage for a federal prisoner is $1.15 an hour. Now, on the public sector workers, Raphael mentioned, I think you said about 28% of the workers in New York State are in unions. But if you just take public sector workers, which are very different than private sector workers in rights and everything else, 70% of the public sector workers in New York State are in unions. And all of them, and all of them across the country, are threatened by this Janus decision, which the Trump administration has initiated by following a brief which reversed the Obama administration supporting it, where any person who is represented by a union that hasn't filled out a membership card will not, the union will not be able to get the dues. Or on the sanitation strike, this is not just the 50th anniversary of a sanitation workers strike in Memphis. There was also one in New York City on February 2nd to February 10th of 1968. Two days later, there was a strike in Memphis and the striking workers and the unions were in touch then and are still in touch in solidarity. But the thing that is not remembered, which should be repeated because the lessons of history can help us in solidarity, is when the sanitation workers in New York City went on strike in 1968. Nelson Rockefeller, the butcher of Attica prison, mm. and John Lindsay threatened to bring in the National Guard to break the strike. And they actually talked about Rockefeller's grandfather had done the Ludlow Massacre of minors. And the workers in all the unions in New York City got together and threatened a general strike to support the sanitation workers. Wow. And that kind of solidarity was there then. And I have revolutionary optimism about unions and about the labor movement and this great slogan, if you don't have a union, fight to get one. If you have a union, fight to make it fight. These leaders can be forced to better represent the members. Yes. yes. That's it. Uh, Tony and then Gregory and myself. I just wanted to mention the laundry workers sent this one thing because mm. we haven't really mentioned their struggle. It's a very, very important struggle who they are. They're a workers center really and they basically organize migrant workers. And really once Crystal Vera was at a meeting of the here, he clearly said that pretty much the regular unions aren't interested in organizing the migrant workers. Mm -hmm. And the laundry workers center, unlike traditional unions, really know how to get the workers to be the organizers themselves. And the way that they do that is when they're preparing for a campaign, they work with the workers for an entire year. Mm -hmm. Like almost every day of the week they work with them to make the workers into the leaders of the struggle. And that's like, really in many ways unheard of. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and they did do this with, uh, I mean they've had m many struggles, but the recent struggle, which unfortunately there was somewhat of a defeat, um, they organized the workers who were warehouse workers at uh, B&H. Um, they had two warehouses in Brooklyn and they were, had a victorious um, union campaign um, of 300 workers. They, I think almost every single worker voted for the union. Mm. And mm. I, mean, uh, I was there at five in the morning when the, the vote went down. It was pretty phenomenal, you mm. know. Um, however, and it was a battle, and they were not really ever able to get a contract with B&H. And what BNH did, and just so you know who BNH is, BNH yeah, is the biggest photo company in the world, mm. basically. Everybody, everything. 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 
Yeah. yeah. Everybody goes there, you know. But Laundry Workers Center is so creative. I remember once there was, the Javits Center was a big, um, like an expo for photography. And we all went there and we stood outside for hours and hours with signs and talking and getting, talking to the people who were going into this expo to try to get them to support the workers. And they did, in fact, there was a huge uh, national petition that many, many photographers signed in support of the BNH workers. But also, but what ended up happening is BNH, because they so did not want to uh, settle the contract, they decided to move their warehouses to awesome. South Jersey. So mind you, these are all migrant workers who live in New York City and being able to move out to South Jersey, they don't have licenses, they don't, you know, they, uh, many of them, it hasn't completely closed, one of the warehouses closed, one of them didn't. They did win a contract most recently, I think it was in December, am I right, December? Yeah. So for 55 store. of the workers who actually work at the store. And they were part of the contract as well. But I think the most, unfortunately what happened with this struggle was when they knew that they couldn't really do all the organizing and they needed a union and they turned to the steel workers, and actually it was bad for them because they knew how to be incredibly creative with their tactics. I mean, we were out there every week in front of B&H. So many, I mean, John was there. I mean, constantly people came out to support this struggle. But the union wasn't behind them in these tactics of really trying to get the community involved and to get it to really spread out and get other people involved. There's also a tremendous film about the Laundry Workers Center um, that we should show here some sometimes that's called the hand that feeds mm -hmm. which is a struggle that they did with much help from the Occupy Wall Street people mm -hmm. for uh, organizing this bakery up on the Upper East Side. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. So I think that there's much to be learned. Um, they're in the middle of a new campaign and hopefully one of the workers is going to speak here next Saturday uh, at, our, our, at our meeting. Oh, yeah. But I also want to say one other thing about the fight for 15, at least here in New York City. We in the PPA, um, we attempted to do a lot of work in, for, uh, for a good long time in support of um, the Fight for 15. In fact, we would have these rallies, we would go into, um, you know, kind of like uh, shut it down. We would go inside to, to um, McDonald's and we would do these kind of mic check things and we would, you know, it was very creative. But in terms of the union, when we tried to go to SEIU, they, they did not really want us involved or want us to play a role. And it was unfortunate because there, we had a lot of people who wanted to do the work and provide support for what we saw as a really important struggle. So that's all. Yeah, um, before I retired, I worked for the City University in the data center. And one of the things that happened was that uh, they expected us to do hundreds of hours of overtime, unpaid, a year. Unpaid. Unpaid overtime, because they had no provision in the, uh, they had no provision for overtime. Uh, so the union filed the grievance and took several uh, years for the grievance to be uh, set, set up and we, uh, we were allowed to file for uh, overtime for the past six months. Now just to say how much, one of my co-workers had 400 hours of overtime in that six months I had 192 hours in that six months, and we were supposed to get that time off, you know, as comp time. Well, the boss where I worked didn't want to do that. So what we did is just one weekend, we got together, the five or six people that got most of the telephone calls, and we said, we're not going to answer the telephone. Mm. <laughs> and so 
you know, the library system for 250,000 students stop working okay and the registration had problems etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know it, it is possible even for a highly you know mechanized jobs to put pressure on them after that that we worked out a, a deal the guy with the 400 hours got a day off a week for a year you know which is about the equivalent to the 400 hours I got three three weeks extra vacation time you know that things got worked out but it is possible to to put pressure on them even if you don't have a union it's possible to you know not answer your telephone on the weekend uh, to you know take you know, they don't know how long the job is going to take. It can take, you know, uh, you can do it, if you're a programmer, you can do it in a half an hour, or you can take two days. And, you know, it's not unless they look at it. So there are ways that workers can resist without, uh, without necessarily having a union. You know, you can prosecute the class struggle, okay, very carefully and I'll, I'll tell you it's they in my job they had a, I was chapter chair I was very much if anybody wanted to file a grievance I would very much you know get that grievance filed but I had people who were working with me you know until from six in the morning to eleven at night and they said no we, we, I can't file for overtime you know because they'll be nasty to me yeah. you, you know you have people like that so it's not just um, it's not just the union leadership being uh, uh, holding back the struggle but a lot of workers don't see that struggling is something that you have to do to defend your rights and so the two things yeah you, you need to have fight to make the union fight but you also have to get the workers involved to want to fight yeah i'm through okay. <laughs> another one yeah one of the things i want to raise is um, on the question of 15 hours um, dollars an hour in the union um i like to raise that Everyone sort of hit and forward the link to the video you know, that Bob and his sister actually made so we could follow that particular work. Also in the Spectrum strike, um, the Spectrum being one of the biggest multinational, Spectrum being one of the, you know, representing um, the profit of one, I think $147 billion in profit as far as the media organization. Uh, they having these commercials on TV. And these commercials is on NBC, CBS. I mean, th these are the ruling class media. Yeah. Millions and millions of dollars is being spent in these commercials. So beyond the fight that we see on the street, uh, that particular fight has to be taken on. So. Us who do media work here, or write on the picket line, or do the, or we should make an uh, ad for the spectrum workers. That's a good we don't have to be in the union. That's why the community labor is the real empowerment. Um, the, the Montgomery boycott strike that went up for 300 something days was consumers called by King. It wasn't at the point of production. So we have to also use uh, our power as community labor to forward stuff. So an ad like that. Um, three minutes, 60 seconds, you know, because they use 60 seconds because of the timing that you pass through the room, you can get someone's attention. And it really works. 30 seconds works, you know what I'm saying? But we need to attack these ads on CBS, NBC, and ABC that the spectrum. And every newspaper, every radio co um, company, they are, uh, they are pouring into the black station, the Latin stations, uh, they're everywhere. One of the things, the other th our point about uh, $15 an hour, and when I first heard of it beyond the Black Lives Movement, 
which is a, a real question of when a movement starts and workers who are most affected, other workers come in and they learn from that. And they use their labor power. They don't necessarily have to be in a union. You're talking about uh, what you need. You're talking about materialism. You're talking about wage, surplus value, and so forth. You're talking Marxism. Workers have became conscious that they produce during the $15 an hour. They became conscious who's the bosses in the multinational corporation. They became conscious that they're not getting a part of the surplus value, the over of so forth and so forth. So we shouldn't be afraid to approach these workers on class discussion and exchange because they are living it. They are fathering it. The $15 an hour struggle, uh, which we should watch. Let's take the 7-Eleven workers. The raid, the ice raid that just happened. Fascist life, fascist life. And we should discuss what's happening with these workers there, because we're often seeing them uh, come in the store from the Korean community, from the Indian community, from the African community, and they're isolated as workers. They're to themselves in the neighborhood. They don't. It's no way for them to give back to the neighborhood because no one is not employed from out of the community in there and so forth. No union don't approach them to organize them. But I think the $15 an hour struggle has encouraged these workers, has showed these workers that you could fight, that you could fight beyond odds and so forth. And I think that being that these 7-Eleven workers is in the neighborhood, in the community, that we as community labor could actually approach these workers. I'm getting this flyer out for 15 and I went to every McDonald's, the Rain Weave, every Popeye, every fast food that I could find and put a leaflet up right in the front. For later on, these workers could see that people is doing outreach to them and they could begin to discuss their labor power and discuss beyond the bosses, even if they leave it up for one day. Someone in that workshop actually saw that particular leaflet. So I think those are some of uh, the organizing that we need to do. The, the question of the laundry workers, um, which was raised several times, because it's such a very important organization in this discussion, but one of the struggles that workers will use years ago, and um, we actually approached the laundry workers, and, and the best way I think we could with it was the struggle of pre-notification. And the union didn't take that struggle up. Just as the spectrum workers, uh, rank and file, actually embraced our uh, issue around uh, MLK Day and solidarity, but the union didn't come forward. And they're not going to always come forward. But I'm still for, I'm in a very tiny union, the UFT, called Home Care Provider, 2,500 workers. And let me tell you, those workers were treated like slaves before they got into the union. I'm not saying everything is rosy now. But when you were picking somebody's child up from school, when someone had to work and they couldn't get there, and you had to take their children to school, or you had, to, they had children with special need or on the spectrum, and so forth, we were doing that work. And you would turn your sheet in, and if the Department of Social Service wanted to, they could question you, bring out, and you didn't have any recourse. They have took weeks of people's uh, wages. Weeks of it, working in hard condition, working in condition where sexual abuse, racism, and so forth. The union hasn't done everything that we wanted, but those particular questions has begun to get addressed and has empowered us as home care providers to address those particular issues and, and so forth. So um, th that's the point of stop there. Johnny, can I make one announcement? Uh, we don't want to do that. We want to do the announcement. But let me tell you um, where we at. Excuse me. Uh, we're doing wonderful with this because we're supposed to be um, <coughs> at 5 o'clock. It's 419 now. And um, I would like to move to the point where we really. Uh, did, oh, I'd like to raise one other thing for 15 then I said. But I'd like to move to the point where we could really say um, how could we forward this work? Mm -hmm. um, I heard some earlier ideas about uh, actually having educational. I know I would like to raise the question. As the labor fraction of the party, I like to raise the question of having um, left-wing communism and infantile disorder because it deals, uh, it would answer some of the midterm election coming yes. up that relates to $15 an hour in the union and why a lot of 
uh, beyond, I think, what someone would say, one of the concrete things that they're organizing in the South, but they also have been informed that the midterm election is coming at back, and you got to pull back on all this little organizing for fifteen dollars an hour. You got to get us back in, and uh, 2018, and, and so forth. So I think we need to, to sort of recognize that. And uh, it's the mother. The Raphael raised the question of um, talking about how union busing is, is actually done. Uh, it, that's a workshop uh, class in itself, and we could. Uh, I mean, we could uh, get, um, use some events, Copeland work, um, uh, uh, dealing with some of these, or we can use other classes. But classes that actually uh, be small classes like this, but actually take what employed to the street, or uh, actually have like, um, uh, for instance, uh, the May Day struggle is actually coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the International Longshoremen's Workers Union, uh, who is calling who is having this May Day a uh, coast-wide uh, longshoreman dock workers shutdown yeah. for eight hours. Never Ooh. been done before Ooh. in this relationship of May Day. Yeah. Yeah. And they are raising the question of $15 an hour in a union. Mm. Because they have oh, social wow. unionism, like they raise the question of Mamiya Abu Jamal, or they raise the question against the wars and so forth. And this particular uh, development, yes, they are raising um, the eight-hour day to, in a real way, like South Africa, Haiti, India, throughout the world, who actually have a May Day for workers to actually go from eight hours to a actually May Day. In addition, Chris Sevier, the local 808 of the Chimpses, that's been a founding member of real uh, developing May Day in, in the U.S. in 2005, along with Workers' World Party and the May 1st Immigrant Group, Chris Sevier, number 808, the Chinses, has written an eight-hour work stoppage for May Day in their contract. Oh, great. This is the first time yeah. this has been That's done. Radical. This is radical. That's this is radical, radical because it's two, two international unions for the part of production, but who is well took us on the way of working and raising $15 an hour in a union. So the $15 an hour struggle is a major struggle for us to father. And we will have many, um, we went, we did outreach to them uh, for $15 an hour um, and uh, Justice that just had a, had a signing of a contract in New York. We went to their meeting, there was over 200 people there and we did outreach Fast to them. Justice. Excuse me? Fast Food, Fast food justice. justice, I'm sorry. Yeah, and so we, we did that and we reaching out to other groups all over the country. They're hitting us up on labor against racist terror and so forth. But we should continue to do outreach to them, but we should also continue to do community labor fight back. And we will forward the struggle in that way. But let me get back to the point of how could we father some of this? How could we fine tune some of this? Let's open the floor on that. Sue and Toby, Sue, please. I like your idea of trying to organize 7-Eleven uh, workers. Because there are three 7-Elevens within about a four block wow. radius of where we're sitting. I mean, let's start someplace and and do something because it really, it, it, it would be a really good exercise for us to do this in the streets, you know, in, in a workplace kind of organizing, which I can't remember the last time we did it in New York, except possibly when we had people in Ford plants in Mawa, in New Jersey, in the early 70s. So let's let's <laughs> right. <laughs> let's go forward with this. Thing. Also, I want to mention that the whole struggle around the MTA is something that goes back to the 60s when they would raise the the subway fare and we would hold open the doors into the subway when you could do that, which is why they changed how the doors function so you can't do that anymore. Um, so we have a long history in this struggle and, and it's wonderful. I, I wanted everybody, to, it, this just didn't happen last April, yeah. <laughs> you know, this has been going on with various iterations 
over decades. So, just had on the table. Well, yeah. um, thank you for saying that, Sue. It just made me think of something else. We all always need money for our different, you know, campaigns, etc. And this place is a very good space for having a benefit. And I remember it was the women, I think, of Workers' World who did the literature or some kind of a book reading. But we, I work with a group that does harmonic insurgents. They sing radical songs. I'm sure we could get the Raging Grannies. And I also know people from the Black Panther Women play who would probably come and do little snippets from that and also Harriet Tubman Returns. So that could be an idea to just have for both Women's History and um, Black History Month, which is much more than a month, but so that we could have a benefit, but not just a benefit. It could be a speak out, a teach in for people who are coming to these uh, vignettes, let's say, and then you could have a conversation, you could break up into small groups and people join, like Sue's idea with the 7-Eleven campaign. The other thing before I have to go, I want people to know that they can go on Women of Color Productions on Facebook and see the 2018 production of Black Panther Women. Why? Because even if you don't go to see the play, you can go to 86th Street and give out flyers and educate the people who are going to see these plays because those are the type of people who want to have this type of information, but they think possibly that the Panthers are still, you know, yesteryear and not today. And the same with the Castillo Theater, which is right here at 42nd, and they're both between February 16th and March 4th. So these are places where you can get the everyday person who thinks they're just doing something for the day to become expanded. Um, I think in the short term, uh, we should start organizing for May Day now. I think uh, given the militancy uh, of May Day this year, I think we can start thinking about what we can do right now to do outreach. And I know that there are several actions uh, that several different groups in New York City have been kicking around uh, where we would raise the issue of labor um, leading up to May Day and incorporate May Day outreach into all of those events so that, you know, come May Day, we can actually measure our impact, who we've reached out to, uh, who are the more advanced elements of uh, these unions that are looking to get into the struggle. And um, I know uh, that the president of the group pushing right to work will be speaking at Columbia University on February 27th. And I think we got to do something around that. Yeah. yeah. I think we got to get everyone out there. We got to have, as Eddie was talking about, solidarity between the unions, and and make that a day where we show that, you know. And then uh, I know. You should go to the New York uh, Labor Council and make that announcement and make a strong plea for people. Do they have open public comments section? I assume they do. Yeah. Yeah. There's a way. Right. There's a way. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. It's always a way. What's up? It's always a way. Oh, <laughs> right. Right. Uh, so I, I think that's a very practical program. I know another thing. Uh, so uh, several of us came together during the, the days of rage to do uh, this action on MLK Day in support of the Spectrum workers. And I know that one of the people that we're working with is uh, a major rep at uh, the publication that they work at. And there's all of these workers in like digital media who are unionizing. Vice, Vo uh, Vox, Slate, and then even older institutions like the uh, LA Times, right? They're all, they're, they're, this is a hub of unionism right now. It's a lot of young people too. And they're really, they're really eager and excited to learn about uh, the power of unions. And then of course you have like the really tragic events that happen around Gothamist and DNA Info, those people are still pissed. I see them still talking about on their Facebook. They lost their jobs because they voted to unionize, and then this fucking capitalist just shut them down. So uh, there's, there's, it's, it's impacting a certain strata of the working class we can reach out to, and uh, we want to maybe do more work with them and try and turn them out to Mayday, because they might not have been radicalized until this point. And now they're ready to go because they've already had the jobs taken. They're fucking 22 years old. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like they already see how bad it is. You know? Let's let's get at them. Yeah. Um, there. If people want to see the movie Street Scenes 15. 
uh, there's a, a link right on uh, our website. It's filmourwayfilms.com slash streetscenes15. Or there's a link just straight on filmourwayfilms.com. There's a link to it. There's also an interesting, um, we have an interesting site called the Demonstration and Labor Movement Channel, which you can go there and you'll find a link to that and you can click on that. There's a lot of uh, other movies about demonstrations, some historic footage, like for example, footage from the um, Wisconsin takeover of the, the uh, State House there and other links and it, it's, it's kind of a gateway to some uh, earlier uh, footage of various demonstrations. Could you so, repeat it's film our way? Film our, or you are, way, films, F-I-L-M-S dot com. And the links are there, or if you want to go directly to the street, to the movie Street Scenes, slash Street Scenes 15, the number 15. And um, there's, there's links there to different things. There's also uh, a link to my other movie, um, Teach, Teachers Are Talking, Is The Nation Listening? And that is a, a feature length documentary we did a couple years ago about the situation with um, the um, businesses trying to take over education and also the movement to kill our kids' spirit with the terrible extreme testing that's going on and, the, and the, the, the killing our students um, with uh, taking away their cre ability to have creative education by more and more testing and by pushing people into charter schools. So it talks about all those issues still extremely relevant today. So there's links to teach, teachers are talking, is the nation listening. So um, that is also available directly online and uh, it's, I think it's worth people seeing because it shows tremendous fight back in the world of education and destroying, attempt to destroy public education. So, so thank, thank you, you very much for having me. big clinic in Union Square, but they, um, anyway, they, they lost that building, and so we, we had to move. And there were um, housekeeping staff, many of whom had been at the clinic, some for 24 years, and they got this letter just saying, okay, in two weeks you will no longer have a job. Yeah. Because where the clinic was moving to, the sites we were moving to, had their own staff in the building, you know, and in the other place, we had the whole building, and in the new places, we were just having a floor. But we all came together, the staff, the doctors, everybody, to say that this is completely unacceptable. And although that term family is kind of bullshit, but in this situation, in a clinic like ours, it really does speak to that everybody is together in this clinic, and we all work together, and, and the housekeeping staff is close to the, the doctors and everybody, you know, it's not like some other places. And so anyway, and they were in 32BJ, but it still seemed like they were going to lose their jobs. And up until like two days before, it looked like that was it. But they were able, we were able to get them to hold on to their jobs. Right. They were sent to different other clinics, but they didn't lose their jobs. Right. So that was really, because I was really, but I also wanted to mention one other thing, which is about Amazon. Uh, I kind of think we need to do more consciousness raising about Amazon. No I know that Fred wrote a fabulous article several months ago in, 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 in relation to what this is doing to retail, yeah. that their use of robots in these huge uh, warehouses that they have. But in the recent stuff that came out that all these workers are eligible for food stamps who work in Ohio at Amazon. Also the struggle that happened, was it in Australia? There was a strike and then the German workers went out in yeah. solidarity to Amazon. So Amazon is organized in some places internationally, just not, just not here. Yeah. But I think, as my, I mean, I know I shared an article on Facebook, the one about the Ohio workers being eligible for food stamps that we need to constantly, even if it's only on Facebook, say the Amazon workers need to organize, mm. you know, and in whatever way that we can do because 
really and truly, this is destroying the jobs, all of these jobs in retail. I mean, there was a recent article about just the amount of re the big box retail stores that are just closing, 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 and the jobs are just disappearing. And who are those workers? They're mostly workers, women and workers of color. Those right. are the workers in those jobs. No so I think that we need to, we need to think of something creative to at least raise more. Because you know what? Even me. I mean, I have to say, I've been addicted to Amazon. You know, you put your credit card in, they got your address. You, you go and click, 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 and it's right. so easy. But in reality, now I'm really, you know, not because I think it's necessarily going to do anything, but I feel like, you know, people. The, the Walmart campaign around how bad Walmart was yeah. and that the workers were eligible, eligible for food stamps affected people yeah. and affected people's willingness to even shop at Walmart. And I just think Amazon is bad, if not worse. And worse. this fucking Bezos, he's the richest person in the entire yeah. world. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. Even richer than Bill Gates, yeah. you know? So I just think we need to, we need to think about yeah. this and yeah. think here, here. about... Um, this was great. We look forward to announcing the next.